Welcome back everyone to the Vintage Sewing Machine Garage. You are taking a look at a sewing machine carrying case and it does not have a name brand on it, but this is the case that goes to a machine that I'm going to be overhauling. And the reason I did not make this part of my purchasing series is that I did not purchase this sewing machine. And no, I did not get it for free. That would have been very nice. But actually this is one of uh, the machines that I periodically get from people who have a vintage sewing machine and they want to have it overhauled. And as long as someone is in uh, you know, my geographic area or they're willing to drive to bring a machine to me, then I, uh, I really enjoy taking on those projects because I don't have to store them and, and list them for sale and wait for someone, you know, for the right buyer to come along. Uh, I don't mind doing that, obviously, that the majority of my machines, I go out, you know, looking for machines to rescue, as you know. But this is still a rescue. It just belongs to someone else. And uh, my client has uh, bought from me before, and they have this machine. Now, I'm going to open up the case. And as I do, some of you who are familiar with vintage machines, and these, this brand particularly will know what you are seeing. Uh, for those of you who are new, you may not. If you ever seen one of these for sale and the price seems reasonable, you might want to consider purchasing it. Uh, and first, because they make fantastic sewing machines. Um, and they also uh, uh, are quite valuable. There is a loyal following for this brand. And uh, anyway, for those of you who don't know what you're looking at, you are looking at a carrying case for a Bernina sewing machine. Now, the Bernina brand uh was founded in Steckborn, Switzerland and uh, their headquarters are still there and they were one of a number of um, European based sewing machine companies and I believe Bernina got its start around the 1890s maybe 1891 or so and even though Bernina is you know yeah it's about a little over 40 years younger than say the Singer Company, that doesn't mean it's not old because the sewing machine business has been around for a long time. Um, this particular model that you're looking at is the Bernina 530 Record. Well, actually you're looking at its case and its sewing deck. The sewing deck of course is mounted in the case. And uh, I'll show that to you guys later when I start showing the machine more. But uh, this machine has uh, all of its little accessories that would have come with it at the time. It even has uh, some vintage needles, which is interesting from a brand I don't recognize here. Um, but there are a number of attachments, and uh, I'll kind of talk about these in a, in a, uh, I don't know if I'll do it in this video or not. Anyway, I see an oiling bottle, and it's kind of cool. It looks like the original one. And, of course, one of the ways to know this is things are color-coded. This particular Bernina comes in a sort of a, like a custard yellow, sort of a light creamy yellow, and sort of a sage color. Um, but Berninas would have different color schemes over the years. But you can see that the oiler, the oiling bottle, is very nice. It's got an angled metal spout. It even has, you know, some of the colors from the machine you can see here. Um, but anyway, I wanted to kind of just show you the box. This is the color-coded <clears throat> Bernina screwdriver, which you can sort of still make out a little bit of the name there. And in this bag, there are a number of attachments. Now, the Bernina company had attachment, attachment design it was their own, meaning if you have low shank or high shank uh, sewing feet, they are not compatible with this, with this Bernina foot system. There is an adapter for the vintage Berninas, and you can buy those online if you want to use other sewing feet. Uh, these sewing feet are beautifully made, right? They're machined in Switzerland, gorgeous quality, but then so were the vintage singers and the German Foffs and you know a lot of vintage companies had high quality and Bernina was no exception and if you get one of these machines and you decide you don't want all of the sewing feet don't toss them aside because these feet depending on which one uh, it is if you look for them on eBay you'll see that they bring pretty high prices uh, later Bernina would change their their sewing attachment foot to a different uh, system 
but it is still proprietary to Bernina. So they've decided to do that. So you have to buy their feet and attachments if you want to use them on their machine. Again, there may be adapters, but that's typically how things go. Now I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit and I'll show you, uh, you know, little touches here. Like there's an outline of the machine that reminds the owner when you go to put it in the case, you put it in with the, uh, the this is a free arm model. Uh, you want to put it in with the free arm facing to the right because it goes in a certain way. And then of course you want to make sure that it meshes with the sewing deck and things don't you know, bump into each other. Uh, it actually has, uh, unlike some cases, it has these steel sort of foot indentations where, you, where your machine's feet go. So that's kind of a nice touch. And like many uh, sewing tables, you have, uh, sewing tables, sewing cases, excuse me, you have little pockets here and that's where the, the, um, the uh, original instruction book was hiding in here. And it has, you know, all sorts of, like any instruction book, it has, it tells you what, what each uh, feature on the machine is. It helps kind of, you know, take you around the machine. You know, what does this do? Uh, and whether you were the new owner originally, or maybe you were just, uh, you're just getting it. This is very useful to have. And, you know, again, it contains a lot of things that, that most sewing manuals do. Um, you can also buy these online. They're a little more pricey than some of the other brands, but that's not surprising given this is Bernina. So I just thought I would show you this. I, I, when I did the, the, the smell test, this does not smell musty. Now it's been sitting dormant for a long time. Here's the good news. It, as far as I can tell, it was not put in a basement or a garage or it would have a musty smell. Uh, I don't know if it was stored in an attic. I, I can't verify that, but there's no bad smell and I don't see any uh, mildew or anything in the case. That's a really nice thing, right? Because you want to keep it as original as possible. And I'm going to pull, lift the machine up here in just a moment and show that to you. And uh, I'll explain why it, it really is nice to have everything as original as possible. One thing I wanted to show you before I, I bring the machine up to discuss is this. Now, I don't know if this was included originally or if you had to pay extra for it, but this is the Bernina Caddy. And on a number of the sewing machine models that Bernina produced, they would, again, either they included it or offered it. I can't verify that uh, offhand. And of course, it has a lot of places. This is where you would store bobbins or, you, I don't know, I think this would be where you stored thread. Um, the manual will say, will tell us this. And of course it has these nice swing out drawers that you would store items in. You can see there's a little uh, lint, where are you, little lint brush hiding in there. Uh, very often you'll find, by the way, uh, sewing feet, like I was showing you in that bag, a lot of times they're in here. So if you see this, or if it's not with a Bernina machine, uh, a Bernina record like this one, uh, be sure to ask someone, you know, take a, you know, show, find a picture of it and show it to people. Because a lot of people who are selling machines, maybe they inherited them, maybe they found it somewhere and they don't want it. They don't, they may not even know that this, this, uh, well, it says Bernina on it. That's kind of a giveaway, but people, you know, if they're not sewing people, they might not know. Be sure to ask for this. Ask them if, you know, it has sewing feet uh, or any kind of attachments or sewing, sewing um, accessories. Okay, well now you are looking at the actual machine that came in the uh, carrying case. And this particular model is the 530, 530 record or record. I'm not sure how it was pronounced. Now this model was a big deal because it, it begins to uh, bring Bernina into <laughs> the more modern age. Uh, a lot of Bernina's earlier machines, Bernina made industrial machines by the way, and then they had home sewing machines that were straight stitch uh, models, wonderful models. It's actually in the late 30s, Bernina developed zigzag models, but you don't see, you almost never see them in North America. They're, they're not common. I've restored two of those. Um, they're called 117L, 117K. Those are the two I've restored, but I've just hardly ever come across them. Um, but I've actually restored and, and found those new homes. But uh, 
Bernina, when they introduced this machine, and I believe it's somewhere in the late 50s, early 60s, you guys correct me if you're a Bernina fan and you know exactly, but uh, this, this model is important because it is part of a line, a series of machines that gives you uh, free arm capability, and you saw the sewing deck in the, in the, in the sewing case I showed earlier. And this is really, um, the record was the, the premium model. There were other Bernina models. You could, if you went into a Bernina dealer, you would see different good, better, best models, right? The quality was the same as I've always talked about in the vintage era with a lot of consumer items and not just sewing machines. When you paid more, you were paying more for features, not for better quality, uh, which is one of the things that, that I love about vintage vintage anything, to be honest. Now, you might say, well, what was the big deal? Why was this a fancy feature? Bernina offered uh, flatbed versions of their machines. Those were cheaper. They also offered um, models that had the free arm feature, but they didn't have all the bells and whistles. Now, one of the things you could get on a Bernina machine, and I think it may have been an option for you to select, you could get a, a foot pedal, uh, which would plug into the machine, or you could get a knee lever, and this particular model has it. Now you might think, well, okay, if this is, I'm just folding it down here, get it out of the way. Um, by the way, it, it actually folds out again, and then if I move the machine closer to the edge of the table, this, of course, this will swing swing down so that uh, you know it's set up for a person who's, um, um, well, I don't know whether it matters if you're right-handed or left-handed, but you're going to use your right knee if you if you end up using this feature uh, if you if you were to sew on this machine. So um, you might wonder, well, where's you know where's the speed control? The speed control is actually in the machine, um, and of course it's connected to the motor. And the device itself is not unlike a foot pedal. It's just it's not set up to to put your foot on. It's it's a very similar device. Um, and one of the things I wanted to show you guys is, I'm gonna see if I can raise the height here. Oh well, no, that is, that is the height. I'll pull the machine towards us so you can see. When you look up top here, you're gonna notice that there's a lot of options. Now, there were different models that had different numbers of stitches. You could do, of course, you could get the model that had both straight and zigzag, and maybe you had, I don't know, blind stitch. But this has what they call the decorative stitches or the embroidery stitches. Again, a fancier model, more features, um, more money, right? And that, that you know, if, if, that's, if you wanted a Bernina and you wanted all the fancy features, you paid more. Let's see, what else would it have had? What else do you see here? You see, of course, this controls stitch length. This knob, the outer knob here, controls stitch width. And if you look, I don't know if it's going to show here, but you can see, uh, you'll see the, the needle bar when I turn this. Watch the needle bar, it moves left side to side, right? And you'll also notice these two little metal, I call them divots, but they're basically little metal protrusions. And those are there because um, this machine is also designed to, to, to sew buttonholes built in without having to do, use a separate attachment. And you know we'll talk a little bit later about the pros and cons of that because buttonhole makers can complicate a machine, make it more complex, more prone to have issues. Uh, I don't know that this one has one, but I'll show you because I've just recently gotten this from the owner. And one of the most special things about this machine that I have failed to mention uh, up until this point is that this is not a machine someone found at a, at a garage sale or one online Which is awesome if that's how you got yours this machine uh, belonged to the owner's mom and uh, You know there was a question as to whether it was still in the family and she found out it was and she was able to get this machine and it's just so happy to hear that it was still in the family and you know, just imagine, you know, how much more special that is. I would give anything if I, if I could have my mom's sewing machine that I remember her having or uh, any of my grand, grandparents' machines. Wow, how cool would that be? So if you have a machine in your family, you're quite lucky. Uh, even if you don't like to sew, you know, I, I just, I'm jealous. But, uh, but anyway, this is, uh, is a wonderful family heirloom. 
so it has even more special i think all vintage machines are special you guys know how i go on and on about them but this one even more so for the owner because it was it was the one at least one of the machines that her mom had now i have mentioned to you guys before that and i and i'm going to make a video about uh, what what sewing machine should you pick if you are going to start learning to restore sewing machines and uh, I'll make a separate video on that at another time but just suffice it to say that when you're dealing with a machine that has lots of stitch capability lots of complexity and it's a European brand uh, not all European brands are like this but many of them are uh, it would not be the first one I would that I would choose if you had a choice to learn to overhaul machines on um, the more complex machines can be more frustrating at times and they are not as friendly trying to get access to them to overhaul them and i'll and i'll give you some some examples of that um, and i just actually put the uh put the camera down here what i did was i just tugged on this and pulled it out it's a nice little device, but I, I pulled out the knee lever so we could get it out of our way. Um, and I want to just show you, I'll show you this. This, of course, is the bobbin area. Now, it's kind of interesting. Bernina, uh, like a lot of companies, just like Singer, had different shuttle designs. Some of their, I'm going to lower this for you guys, some of their machines had rotary hooks, and some of them had oscillating hooks this particular model has an oscillating hook right and you'll notice that if I turn the wheel it's going to come here and it's going to go back and forth it, oscillating means it goes back and forth back and forth and Bernina called their oscillating hook uh, I don't know it's called a CB hook but I, that may just simply refer to the fact that it's oscillating uh, CB stands for central bobbin the key here though is Bernina claimed to have a special engineering design that made their oscillating hook better than others now all companies said this about their machines and Bernina swore that it would prevent thread jams and it was going to be awesome and I think it is awesome is it more awesome I don't know that's really uh, that's really hard to say uh, and you'll notice for example uh, some machines uh, when you want to access the free arm they have little uh, countersunk uh, bolts or screws that you take out well, not Bernina. You have places to oil, but there is a way to get this off, but it's, it's, it's got this clever hidden little lever here. Again, it's one of those things that it's not straightforward, and you need to, to either watch someone do it or be careful how you do it because you don't want to harm the machine. It's not because the machine's fragile, but if you don't know, again, you know, it's like any other puzzle. So this is one of the things I often tell people don't do something until you have some idea of how it's supposed to work because you can cause a lot of issues and problems for yourself. Now, one of the things I noticed, just like I say, I'm just now taking a look at this machine. It was brought over a week or two ago, finally getting to look at it. And you'll notice that it's remarkably clean. And it does, and, and, and I've noticed that machines that were kept in carrying cases typically, typically, not always, are cleaner with less dust and grit than those that were in sewing tables even though you know in sewing tables they fold um, most modern tables or tables since the since uh, the turn of the 20th century uh, the machines can fold down and the table can be used uh, for multi-purposes and even those again even though you would think well the machines hidden but they still collect lots of dust and dirt but it's nice to see that this machine is clean. I'm again, I'm just making a cursory glance here, and I don't see a lot of lint. There may, be, we're going to check it just to be sure. Now, um, this is something I've kind of talked to you guys before, and I want to talk about it again. It's very important, and this is this machine is a good example of how you want to be careful with any vintage sewing machine that has been sitting. Right, you've just gotten it. Let's say you got this. Maybe you won it at an auction, or you, 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 you found it somewhere. You purchased it, um, and now you've got it home. It's like, oh, now I got to check it out and see how it does. Right, the seller doesn't know or didn't didn't say anything. Remember in the past what I've told you guys about machines. Just assume, right? Unless someone sells it to you and said, yeah, I sold it last week. It was doing great, and they showed you, and everything looks 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 really happy. Don't make that assumption. 
assume, even if it's incorrect, that the machine has been sitting for a long time and it is asleep. You guys have heard me say, I, restoring a sewing machine from the vintage era is like waking up the machine. When machines sit for long periods, they, they get fussy. They don't move the way they're supposed to. That doesn't mean they're broken, but they are slow and sometimes they're frozen and you can unfreeze them. And once you do, they, you can make them run happily again, but you can't do it. Um, you just can't be rough with them because no one could engineer a machine to, to, to sit dormant and get frozen up and just be able to, you know, you don't want to force any part of the machine. And this is the thing that I'm um, very, you know, you hear me say this a lot and I, and I can't, it doesn't hurt to repeat this guys. Um, it's much easier to take your time, figure out. Okay. So before I do anything on the machine, um, I'm going to, uh, uh, well, one thing to say is I, we don't have to worry about the cord because the owner, uh, the original cord was missing, and but they were able to get a reproduction um, new cord that is uh, the cord for this machine, for this Bernina record, and that's wonderful. Um, but So we don't have that, but we have a lot of things to check, so let's take a look. Remember I told you when you're not sure, you know, it's like, well, how do I know what's working and what's not? And the fact is, you don't, right? So you want to look and see what's happening. There are different reasons why things on a machine may or may not move. It could be that there's a setting you need to change and you're not aware of it, right? Uh, I've told you guys when you look at something like <clears throat> a Singer 401 or a Singer 500 that has a knob, it can turn, but it has to be either be pushed and turned and the other one has to be pulled and turned. But they don't say that on the knob. This is when the sewing manual or YouTube videos are your friend. Never be in a hurry. As long as you're not in a hurry, you're going to be fine. Okay, I, I don't want to make you panic or alarm you, but don't be in a hurry. <clears throat> I know you're probably excited. It's like, oh, I got this Bernina and it's awesome and I can't wait. That's wonderful. But channel and harness your passion so you don't hurt the very machine you're excited about having. Okay, now the there are different you know, knobs and uh, levers. Uh, bells and whistles that all these machines come with, you'll notice that here, this this is the uh, the tension, upper thread tension adjustment. And I as I turn it, it seems to turn okay. It's not requiring any great force. There is, you know, it's not, it's not, it doesn't spin loosely, but it's not supposed to, right? And above, see if I can get a good shot of this. We'll see, I don't know if I can or not, but we'll try. The Bernina, uh, and some of the Neckies, like the Neckie BU Mira, has actually a little, it's not a window, but like a little opening where you can see a number, right? And you can adjust the tension depending on what it is that you're uh, sewing with. And the manual tells you how it thinks you should be able to, uh, or, or how you should uh, adjust, when you should adjust tension and, and how you should do it. Okay, let's come back down and we'll look at the front for just a minute. So. Again, so, you know, the tension. Now, I don't know. I, we have to do test stitching before we know if the tension dial is going to work. Uh, there's a tension spring inside here. It's not easy to see like some of the uh, other brands. Singers are easy to see that, you know, the spring is hanging out, as is, as is the case on most of your Japanese copies of Singers. But let's look at the front. I showed you guys uh, that the needle bar will move when I turn this dial. Now, notice... When I, you know, when I turn it, I'm not forcing it. I'm, you know, I'm applying uh, effort and it moves, okay? And I suspect that it, it is definitely in need of oil, but it's not frozen. And you can see there's a little window here where you can see the number. They, they got clever. Instead of just putting the, the number, uh, you know, on a, on a decal or something uh, here, it's, it's hidden inside, right? It looks like some sort of... Uh, there's a, there's a marker, center marker, and you can see there's a numbered dial, and as you turn it, the numbers change. Well, that's good news. That's very good news because this, remember the, zig, the zigzag mechanism that I have told you guys about on zigzag domestic machines is the first mechanism that will often freeze, right? Even when you get up and down, because notice when I've got my hand on the, on the hand wheel on the right, and when I turn it, notice, and, and again, I'm not forcing it, it's coming up, and it's coming down 
and it's not fighting me. It's not, now it's not, it's not, you can tell it hasn't been oiled, right? You wouldn't want to sew with it like this. And that's why, you know, if I can get this to move and I can also see it move sideways, you might think, oh, we'll just plug it in. And no, 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 we're not, we're not ready to sew yet. Okay. But the good news is it's not um, frozen like concrete because I've had machines like that before and they are a labor of love to say the least but you, you can save anything and God knows I, I have before let's take a look over here back over here so we have this this knob right here and then we have another um, lever now this you can um, you think well if you got the knob why do I have this to turn the 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 stitch with the zigzag well that's because this uh, device has a piece under it that moves Okay, it actually, if that's showing up, like if I hold this, this little nub down here, okay, it slides toward the machine. Now, I need to oil this, but it, but again, it went, it moved, and it, you know, if it's super stiff, just you just want to stop. If it doesn't move, stop, okay? This is plastic, but there should be a way to, um, to get lubrication in here to get it moving again. But when I see plastic, actually, this piece right here, I'm going to, have to get a magnet check I think this might be metal on this model but this piece here I know is plastic coming down right now as I've told you guys before behind plastic knobs and levers should be steel which is on the inside of the machine right that's the mechanism so it's okay that this is plastic because it's worked fine and, and you have vintage models and they work beautifully because the plastic was bonded with some kind of adhesive to the steel or it was screwed to the steel. But those steel parts have to play. They have to behave properly for the plastic to do its job. If, if the mechanism is frozen or bound up and you start trying to force it, the plastic will give and it will break and you will be very unhappy. Uh, you don't want to do that. It's not necessary. Don't be in a hurry. I know I sound like a broken record, but believe me, it's easy for people to, to get so excited that they, they don't know what to do. Now, um, this, of course, uh, controls stitch uh, length. It starts zero here, and it goes down to what they say is four. Um, for your zigzag I was just talking about, this model was revolutionary at the time because it could do a four millimeter zigzag. And you have to remember, the further back in history you go with vintage sewing machines, the early zigzags were not that wide. This one, this model, wow, you could do four millimeters. Today, I think, my God, I think they have machines today that can do, I don't know, 10 or 12. You guys correct me, you may, you may have a, a better number than I do. The point is, modern machines can do wider zigzags. I think for most people in sewing, it may not matter, or it might matter to you. Uh, that's really up to you to decide. We have down here, um, we have another knob, this particular one. Now, when I take hold of it and I go to turn it, it doesn't move, okay? And I'm pushing on it, not too hard, but I, I expect it to move. What this tells me is that knob was not used very often and it's frozen, okay? We can unfreeze it. We're going to try, but we're not going to force it. We are not going to break this wonderful knob just because we're impatient. Uh, that's kind of silly. Uh, we have another knob here, and it too, it kind of thinks it wants to move, but it's it's taking too much effort, and so I'm not going to force this. I notice that with the stitch length lever, it goes up into reverse, or appears to, and then it stops at number two. Now, normally, if your stitch length lever is frozen, it doesn't want to move anywhere. I have a suspicion that the reason it won't come down to four is that one of the adjustments on the machine has been set to keep it. Remember, you can lock in your stitch length to a certain range on many machines. You can do that on the Neckies, on some of the Singers, um, or many of the Singers actually that have that, that sort of round plate where the stitch length lever slides up and down in the middle of. So I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that the stitch length lever moves freely 
but but the fact that it has a limited range I'm gonna go back and look at the settings and I have to go back and I will look at the manual right I'm gonna go back and see because I see Bernina's a lot less often than singers I have uh, I have restored uh, a number of these Bernina records but nothing like you know your singer um, Slanomatics, your 201s and so forth so before I do that and of course the other thing is that a lot of the brands particularly European brands were constantly making changes so you know a button might do one thing and then next model series they make it do something else so go back and check your manual if you're not sure but I'm I can say from experience that I think I say I think we will see but I think that this is a setting and I need to move something else in order to get it to change so that's that has hope behind it um, let's see before I look up we go up top I'm going to uh, pick it up and turn it sideways it is a very heavy machine the motor is a beast of a motor um, very heavy now I'm gonna pull back because I want you guys to see the whole side here now this of course is where you would put your bobbin to do bobbin uh, winding I'll demonstrate that once we get the machine overhauled and finished and it's ready to to be tested we can always demonstrate that if you, if you guys think that would be uh, uh, helpful for you and you'll notice that there's a up, up top we have two spool pins and then we have one here I believe this is where the bobbin will go but again I'm doing that from memory and you always want to double check memory alone is not enough um, now this of course is your hand wheel and this hand wheel clutch knob is made of plastic it has a metal screw the drive shaft is metal but this is plastic now I'm going to just hold the hand wheel like I would if I were going to get set up for bobbin winding and I'm going to turn this and see if it turns no this does not well there it does it did turn uh, I was about to give up and stop because I would, you know, <clears throat> first of all, I would uh, take a look at my little set screw to make sure it wasn't overly tight. But this did turn, so that's good, right? You always want to be gentle with these knobs, uh, especially when they're plastic. So this one uh, looks like it's not frozen. It's been sitting a while, but again, once you do this enough, you get a feel for that. Here we have another knob, right? This one moves. See, this one wants to move and if you look closely guys we may have solved that mystery right here on the video notice that when you turn this now our stitch length is coming down so this knob is a way of controlling the range of your stitch length and I'll go back and check you can see when I turn it to the right this is hopping up uh, and I'll go back and look at the manual again this would have been a gee whiz feature that says hey don't worry about your stitch length uh, not being consistent typically there's enough built-in tension where many people never never lock in their stitch length on vintage machines um, when you're sewing heavy fabrics sometimes that you know that the the energy that the machine is using to get your stitches made can cause this to kind of wiggle or move out of and you don't want that you don't want your stitch length changing on you in the middle of a of a project or a stitch unless you want it to so again this is uh i'll turn this but see this is moving freely so i'm i'm, I'm very happy and then it stops it's stopping because it's that's that's as far as it needs to go right now we will still be lubricating this but it's nice to see that that is uh working right now I can come all the way up into reverse and that's how you would normally uh, set things up uh, and again I will go over um, you know more of the specific purposes of the levers when we do the debut video when it's ready for the uh, for the owner uh, what else to show you let's take a look at the back of the machine uh, you get to hear me groan now what do you see back here you see of course the spool pendles you see um, you will notice now this machine like many vintage machines has a few nicks and scratches and that's to be to be expected most of these scratches would have occurred either when the machine was put in and out of the case um, and and there's a couple on the top little paint nicks on the top that I suspect uh, I'll show this to you in a minute I suspect those happen sometimes when the machine goes in now you remember that this machine has this wonderful caddy and I'll go ahead and show you how it sits on the machine 
right? It kind of rests on this giant pin here, and then it simply sits just like this. Let's give you a better look at that, right? And then it all goes into the case nice and nice and compact. Uh, here, of course, is our is our uh, is our plug, and you can see here on the label. <clears throat> we'll zoom in for you guys. You can see. Let's see what. What does it say? Of course, this was meant for the North American market, so it's okay. It's good for the 110 voltage. It says Fritz Grugoff Limited. I believe that's the founder of the company. Bernina Sewing Machine, Steckborn, Switzerland, 110 volts, AC, DC, 1.05 amps, right? That's a good, strong motor. Um, not, not the highest amperage, but, but that's okay. I've told you guys amperage does make a difference, but it's not everything. Um, now, uh, one of the things to note here, I'm going to take the caddy back off because, and, and don't let it hit your, your, uh, your uh, take-up arm there. Swivel it out, and then you take it off of the, that big pin right here. And you'll notice that over time, you'll notice there's like a little space here, space here, and you can see the arc. And this is simply where the caddy has been put on and off, and it's been swung around, and that's just what it did. It's okay, we're gonna clean it up, but um, it's, it's not unusual for that to happen on any sewing machine. So it's not something to, to, uh, to really worry about or be concerned about. Uh, I love the fact that this, this is a nice heavy duty steel uh, take, up, um, take up arm for the presser bar, right? And that's a really nice thing to see because companies would later move that to plastic. Okay, uh, I'm gonna, turn things around here and we will show you the top of the machine. Okay guys, now that we're back to the top, let's see if we can get a little more height here. Now I have restored 530s, 730s, I haven't worked on the 830s or the 930s. I've also worked on some that were not records. They were, you know, the mid-price machines, still wonderful. Some of these machines, and I believe it's probably the 730, they have, they, the lid looks just like this. They tilt back, and then sometimes part of it tilts back and the other part on the side tilts up where the bobbin winder is. And this is an example of when Companies are always messing with their designs and they come out with the new successor model and they change something. Sometimes it's to improve it, sometimes it's just to tell people they changed something. Um, but this particular model, actually, we'll use our Bernina screwdriver here, it has pins, right? So you can see, here's one, here's another, right there, okay? And then there's a hole here that Bernina kindly marked with red, and right here. And so, and, and <clears throat> when I'm finished with the machine and when we get it ready to uh, get it back to its owner, this will have been, will we have greased these pins to make them come out in and out a little bit easier. That's easily done, but, but important and helpful. Now, oh, I told you about the lid. So you'll look here and you'll see, again, a couple of paint nicks. These are just, these are just uh, part of the provenance and history of its use. Um, you know, you can try to touch those up, but I personally, you know, I like machines that have been cleaned and restored, but I like to keep them as is. Uh, I'm not going to, to try to match the paint. I don't really feel that strongly about it. I think it would draw more attention to itself. And you know what? It's part of the history of the machine, and I think it's just fine. Now, um, you see, if you look, you'll see that the door here does open, right? And it's got that little tension, uh, I don't know if you'd call that a tension spring or a or a, uh, a, a catch, but of course I'll put a little dab of grease under there. So the next, when the when the owner gets it back and they close this, you know it, they don't have to work as hard. What else can we show you guys? We're going to look up top here. Let's see. Okay, guys, you are now looking down on the top of the Bernina five three zero record. Magnificent construction quality. flashlight on so you can see a little bit more. Now, 
This is important to note. Um, when you were looking at this inside, you were looking at a very complex uh, set of machinery. And this is why testing it, like I've got my hand on the handle here, and I'm turning it, and you can see, well, actually you can't because I had loosened the clutch knob. Now, you'll see, you'll see how the gears are moving. And one thing to point out, this is, there's so much wonderful steel here. You see it, and here's, the, uh, here's one of the lever adjustments, and notice I can still move it. I'm testing it to see if it will move. So when I push this and I come this way, yes, it's stiff. It's moving because it's, it's thirsty for oil, but it, it is not frozen. That's a good sign. I'm not going to just keep you know, moving it back and forth. We're going to get some oil in there. This one, this lever is where all of your decorative stitch control is. Now here, this is all steel, wonderful steel. Looks almost like the inner workings of a clock. And when you move this lever to the right, you can then slide it, pull it out, and then you can slide it. Now notice when I pull it this way, it's moving. I have movement here, but when I try to move it forward, it's not moving up to the top. What that tells me is this is this is basically not ready to move yet, right? It's it's been sitting for a long time. And so I'm going to have to, I'm not going to force it, obviously, because it doesn't want to move. So I've got to get in here and start. Um, basically, I'll take my flashlight and start working with some sewing machine oil to see if I can get movement and see where it's sticking. It will, it should be able to move again, but we're not forcing this. Don't do that. Now, when you're trying to decide if you're going to buy one of these machines, you're going to buy it used. I always tell people, I know that you don't always have the luxury of being able to test a machine. Sometimes it's sitting out in a barn somewhere. No, literally, I once bought a machine that was in a barn surrounded by goats. So, <laughs> out in the country. So, again, you don't always have that option. Most of the machines I've worked on, you know, even if you can't test it for stitching, it should be salvageable unless something dramatic is wrong with it, like it was dropped or, you know, lots of parts missing. This machine is one of those, if you're going to buy it used, I highly recommend that you um, do your best to try to see if it will sew. Now, obviously, if it's frozen, you can't do that because you're going to, you can harm the machine if you try to use it when it's frozen. But let's say it's not, okay? You really want to check two places. There was a, this gear is steel. So is this one. So all of these gears are steel, but there are two that are not, right? And you might not catch them right away. They're made of nylon. There's this one right here, literally right there, and then this one. Now, I had to replace, I bought a, a, a record. It was either the 530 or the 730. I don't recall which. And you can't tell always by looking at it. But this particular gear on the machine I had bought had a crack in it. Now, cracks can happen because of age, but they often can happen because machines are stored in places where you have a lot of freeze-thaw. You either stored where it got cold and hot back and forth, and the plastic just couldn't take it anymore. Or it could simply be that the plastic is tired. The machine was used a lot, and it's just worn. I have no idea of knowing if these are cracked. Now, what I'm going to be doing um, as I start to, before I go uh, all the way into restoring the machine, and then I'm going to talk more about the, about the motor and, and why that's, you know, uh, a very involved process to get to the motor because Bernina, like many European companies, designed their machines to not be easily accessible or to be more frustrating for those of us who like to restore them. It's not impossible. It just takes more time, you know, compared to a straight stitch singer. It's, it's, it's a lot more involved. Um, but these two gears, if they have cracks, what will happen very often is the machine will, let's say you plug it in and you've got movement and you can test the sewing, the stitching. You will test the stitching and the stitch will look fine and then all of a sudden it'll change, right? And then you turn the hand wheel more and then it'll start stitching fine again, but it'll have this place as it comes around the gear. When it hits the, the place that's damaged, it doesn't, it doesn't engage, and it's a, it's a telltale sign that you have a gear issue. So what's the good news? The good news is if you have that problem, 
they, they make reproduction gears for both this and this, this area. Now, this gear is said to be not quite as involved as this one. Well, I can tell you, having replaced this gear, it is very, very time consuming. And the, the, what you actually need to do to replace the gear, um, you know, once you get everything apart that you need to, so you can get to the gear and replace it with a new one, that procedure is actually not that bad. I think it you know, took, me, took me an hour, but getting everything apart so you can get to the old gear, I, the situation I had where the gear was cracked, it took me weeks because moving parts that had been sitting since they were put in there and they were not really intended to come out all the time or have movement. They had no lubrication or they were lubricated with some kind of substance that many of the Europeans used so their machines would not rust in the salt air of coming across the Atlantic. Whatever the case may be, um, getting the rest of the pieces in the machine moved out of the way, you know, so that I could get to this, it took a long time. And the reason it took so long, because I knew what I was having to do, but you can't go fast, because if you do, you're gonna break something. And these pieces had to be coaxed with lots of penetrant oils and lots of heat and lots of time. And I would move a little bit and then let it sit and come back. It was a very involved project. Uh, the other thing you could do, of course, you could take it to, say, a sewing dealer, maybe a Bernina dealer, and if they were willing to work on a machine this old, they know they're not always willing to do that, but if they were, uh, you could always pay them to do it, but you're going to pay handsomely. So before you buy any of these Berninas, the 530, 730, 830, 930s, before you do that, you want to do the best you can to test it for this, because if you don't, you or someone needs to replace these gears in order for the machine to function properly. Um, you may be fortunate and get one and the gears are fine and it sews beautifully. And this thing is really old and it, you know, it may have no problems at all. What you're seeing here, you see some, you know, that's just discoloration from, from uh, uh, the other gears, the metal gears that come into play with it. So again, this is just something to be aware of if you're gonna buy one of these because Berninas sell for a real pretty penny. And if you're buying one unrestored, um, you need to, to uh, if you're gonna buy it without knowing and not being able to test it sewing, then I would not pay a lot of money for it because you're, you're, you're taking a chance you don't know if it's, if it's in good enough shape for you to uh, you know, just take it home and put, put it through a normal restoration process, which that in itself is time consuming. But you really wanna be careful that um, I'm not pushing the lid in all the way because it's got to cut to come out for my work on the machine. But you want to just keep that in mind, guys. This is, uh, you know, I've done a video series on what I call hybrid sewing machines. These are machines that are almost all metal, but they have a few plastic pieces. This, interestingly, is one of them. Now, the ones I showed you in my hybrid video, those were made in Japan much later. Those were like early 80s machines, late 70s, early 80s. But those remain Japan. Remember, the Japanese kept metal, kept all metal machines until the 1970s. But, you know, here we are. This is a, what is this, a late 50s, probably early 60s model. And they were already, um, you know, having to take, to decontent, take some of the metal out because they were really trying to keep their costs down so they could compete with all of the machines that were being made in Japan because the Japanese were, a very low cost market at that time. So there you have it, the Bernina record 530. You're looking at some of the things that I'm checking and testing. And again, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about, when I talk about the machine, we'll go into the details of what these different buttons are. And then I'll show you the method I'm going to use to try to get access to these. I'm gonna to have to take the bottom out and uh, we will definitely uh, cover, you know, what these do. and, and you know, when I make the debut of the machine, I'll show you what these different features on the machine are uh, meant to do. Um, and sometimes people don't use them often, they stick, or it could be this, this thing has sat. It could have sat in a hot attic space, uh, although I suspect it might not have, only because if it had, a very, it's very unlikely the zigzag would even be working at this point. So it may have been in a closet. But <clears throat> there you go. This is... Uh, uh, 
a machine that has a very loyal following. The Bernina brand has a very devout following. People are willing to pay really good prices for them, but a lot of their parts are proprietary. And, um, and like I said, working on these machines is not impossible, but it just takes a lot more time and you have to really slow down and study how you're going to get access to the various parts of this machine. It's not always straightforward, and that's why I don't suggest making a Bernina record your first, uh, your first choice when you're going to go and learn how to um, restore or practice restoring a sewing machine. Doesn't mean you cannot do it, but it wouldn't be my first choice. Um, my first sewing machines that I restored were um, a straight stitch singer, right? Um, and uh, I'm glad that I, you know, because I might have gotten discouraged if I had taken on a European machine, whether it's a German Pfaff or a Swiss Bernina or even some of the Neckies from Italy. Um, one other thing to mention to you guys before we go is that um, checking out the motor on any sewing machine is important, and especially when you're checking the motor brushes, because you have to know that the motor brushes are in good shape. You never want the brushes to wear out completely. It will short out and ruin the motor. Motors for Berninas, Berninas are not cheap. And you cannot buy, I'm not aware that you can buy a generic motor. Whatever you can buy for the Bernina is going to cost you. And as I mentioned to you guys, getting access to things on this machine is not as simple as it is for other brands. So, if you look, you will see access screws underneath this machine, right? And so I'm going to need to remove the base from the body in order to get to the cover on the motor. Because if you look, guys, there are no screws to take the cover of the motor off. I don't know if this is to keep owners from messing with the machine or if they just wanted to get you to come in to pay for the service. But getting this cover off means going underneath the machine, which we have to do anyway. And then we can go in and check the motor, clean the commutator, um, and... Um, and, and check those brushes. It's so important to do that and, and give an overall inspection of the motor before um, before we finish you know, uh, taking care of the machine generally. So there you go. Um, I just wanted to show this to you. Uh, again, um, Berninas have some really interesting features. Um, when I get to working on the machine, I may make a video to show you guys from the side. The side panel comes off because I want to check out the pulleys. Uh, because the Bernina has uh, two belts, right? It has the motor, the belt connects to the motor, connects to a pulley, and then another belt connects from the pulley to the hand wheel. And that is part of the secret sauce of why Berninas are powerful sewing machines, and it's why Sears asked the Japanese to copy it. But that's a video for another day. Thanks for watching, everyone. Please feel free to subscribe to the channel and say hello in the comments section below. Take care.